Welcome to the Kerrville Bible Church Podcast, where we seek to encourage and equip you for the work of ministry by taking a pastoral look at a variety of biblical and theological topics. Stay tuned until the end of the episode to learn how you can submit a question for us to answer on the podcast. Welcome back to the Kerrville Bible Church Pastors Podcast. My name is Toby Baxley. I'm your host. I'm joined this week by Scott Christensen, Murray Van Gundy, and we've got a uh, new topic for you uh, today. But before we get into that, I um, want to check in with you guys and see if you had a million dollars, what would be the first thing you bought? If dollars. That's an illegitimate question. I, how so? They're all illegitimate questions. They're all illegitimate icebreakers. It's all it's all fantastic. Oh my goodness. Fantasy. Yeah. I, I'm not even sure I wanna go down that road. <laughs> How well, like, what would your fle- your your fleshly yeah. fleshly desire be? Like a like a not have to filter it as a as a I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. <laughs> I'm not looking for your sanctified answer. <laughs> yeah. My my fleshly side would say I, I'd want to use at least a portion of that money to buy a larger house so that we could have when our family children and grandchildren come and visit, we'd have a place for all of them. Yeah. Uh our our kids came last year for Christmas. And uh, they were, the, you know, some Stepping were laying on, on the floor, other. some were like, you know, like sleeping bags, you know, here and there. You could hardly walk through the house, you know. But, uh, yeah, that my fleshly side would say, yeah, I'd, I'd like a slightly larger house. You'd like a bunk room. Yeah, I think you could you know. spiritualize that a little bit, though. I, I think could, you could kind of, yeah. you know, family. I could and justify I think you it. could yeah. give a little. Sure. It's not completely fleshly, I yeah. don't think. Yeah. That's yeah. my answer. Yeah. Okay. Gosh. I'd want to pay off my house, for one, and then, uh, and then redo the church's sound system. <laughs> there you go. There you go. There you go. See, there's some spiritual. There's, that's a little yeah, spiritual. you know, I'm I'm always thinking good about steward of what's your money. The best yeah. That, but then you don't get to deduct taxes on. I, 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 I'm thinking for sure. Murray, like like a really tricked out bass boat. Probably. Yeah, but then I need a bigger place to go use it. Like, there's really not any good places here to use you it. You gotta have you know? a bigger truck to pull it. Bigger truck, which would be great. Well, I mean, you can afford I'd it. Like though. A, I'd like a, a, a nice F 250. F 350, that's a little. That's too much. Yeah, that's saying. Dually? I really have to pull something. Yeah. No, Dually would be the, the F 350. So okay. an F 250 is kind of in between. Yeah. But a little bigger, you know, looks a little cooler. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what I'd. I don't know. I really don't. I really don't know what I'd want to do with a million dollars. I mean, I, I, I really would, in a non-spiritual, spiritualizing it, want to help some people. You know, some people want to want to help with that. And then, I don't know. I'd 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 take it and build <laughs> build Rodrigo a church in in Valparaiso, which wouldn't there, cost a lot because. Yeah. Of, it being in Chile, it wouldn't cost that much to have to do yeah, that. Right. There you go. So if you're listening and you've got a million dollars to give, don't give it to Murray. <laughs> he doesn't have any idea what he nope. would do with it. <laughs> no. uh, uh, what's What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? <laughs> don't since answer. The, since the don't million answer dollar icebreaker was a, questions. The million dollar was a flop. Let's go to this one. What best piece of advice? Yeah, I know what mine is. Yeah. I know right off the top of my head. Yeah, really. Lay it on yeah, us. It was my my roommate when I was getting cold feet about marrying my wife Jennifer, and he basically slapped me upside the head and said, "You better marry that girl, or you're." going to be in big trouble. And I listened to him and um, the Lord. asked her father for her hand in marriage. And yeah. he said, basically said, yeah, I don't have a problem with it. <laughs> <laughs> I have a problem and I'm glad he didn't. She's the best thing that God has ever given to me. Yeah. I hate advice. So I don't know. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> What's the best piece of advice? I don't know. You, you go. Need you go. You need I, to every call these questions. Why don't you let us know beforehand instead of popping them? Uh, give us at least. I like the surprise. The morning, just the morning. You just don't have to give morning. us a whole day, but like All the right. morning. Okay. Well, I usually don't pick them until like until when right I'm sitting when you're here. sitting. I've got a list. <laughs> <laughs> until you're sitting here. Uh, mine had it was related to marriage, but just 
you know, I think I came in uh, maybe as most people do with unrealistic expectations of what marriage was all about. And, uh, and so just, just the idea that don't, don't require your wife to be for you <coughs> what only Jesus is, mm-hmm. you know, she can't save you. She can't meet all your needs. Um, really only Jesus can do that. That's right. Yep. So that helps me that trigger. So probably best advice had to do with marriage. Katie and I were in, we were being counseled. This is after 20 years of marriage. So it wasn't early on. And the, uh, pastor whom we went to him and his wife, he said, he, he asked me, do you view your relationships kind of in a in a sequential order, God first, wife second, family third, church fourth. Do you view? And I, you know, I'm thinking. I was like, Yeah, I guess I do. And that's kind of what I thought. He said, View your view, view them in concentric circles, and view the center circle as you and Jesus and your wife, and that you fight for that circle and you protect that circle. You protect you. That your kids are even outside of that circle, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. You and you fight to protect that circle, and then your wife doesn't have to compete with God. That it's not a competition. That she doesn't because she's going to lose every time. If it's like, well, God first, she's going to compete. Now, obviously, that's within the context of biblical things and not calling someone to do something against God. But that really, you're in a partnership with her. You're one flesh with her, and it's it's your one flesh relationship with Christ. Mm. And there's individuals, we obviously have, I have my individual relationship with Christ and she has hers, but that you're one flesh. And so that really helped view and I realized I had not done a good job of protecting that circle. Mm. So. Good. Well, all right. Uh, let's get into our topic of the day. And uh, we've these are kind of a couple of questions that we had on our list that have been either generated by our own brainstorming or, or those who have sent in questions. And I think this is a little bit of both. It's a couple of different questions. Number one is how do we respond to family members or close friends who have embraced the new sexual ideology? Uh, in other words, responding to those who come out as gay or transgender, um, et cetera. And another question is should a Christian or, work for a company who asks them for their preferred pronouns or pushes a diversity agenda. Yeah. So in, in light of, in light of our sermon on Sunday, um, I think this is a timely topic Mm -hmm. that Murray brought our way. Yeah, I think it's, it's, First of all, there, there's some some groundwork that needs to be laid, and Murray did a great job with the sermon on Sunday, laying a lot of that groundwork. You know, but I, I think it's important to recognize that that this this new sexual revolution, the LGBTQ plus <laughs> ideology, is not going away anytime soon. Uh, it is only ramping up and and continues to do so. It seems daily. And uh, and I think as Christians, we need to, to not bury our heads in the sand and recognize that this is a serious issue. Mm-hmm. And it, it's increasingly becoming one of the flashpoints, you know, between, you know, what, what I would consider not just a post-Christian worldview, but a decidedly anti-Christian worldview worldview that that is dominating you know our our secular culture and um in, in such a way that i think it is in many ways specifically targeting a christian worldview a christian sexual ethic you know and and much of what murray talked about on sunday in terms of god's design for humanity god's design for male and female and and are being created in his image as compl- complementary uh, individuals that God designed uh, to reflect His glory. All of that is is receiving a full on frontal attack mm-hmm. in, in the culture with with this whole 
sexual revolution and uh and it's permeating every aspect of our society and so so we've got to figure out how do we respond to this for sure yeah, yeah. well you know we could take these questions one at a time maybe and what what do we say to you know one of your one of the sheep in your your shepherding group they come to you and say hey i've 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 got a job offer and they've asked for my preferred pronouns on my on my intake form well, I would have to say that if they are asking for your preferred pronoun, you know, you know, I would ask the question why. Yeah. And um, and if they are wanting you to participate in embracing what is essentially a lie, I don't think in good conscience as Christians we can we can do that. And um, and so it, it extends to other you know extends to other questions as well, which is should we speak to people who are transgendered using their preferred pronouns? Mm-hmm. Um, and and the question was asked a number of years ago. You know when you have a family member or or you know a friend uh, who is who is gay and they they. Um, you know, you know, are, are getting married in a in a gay wedding. Uh, you know, do you attend that wedding? Um, and, and to me, it's the question is: Are you are you going to participate in what is ostensibly a lie? Mm-hmm. Uh, and and I don't think as Christians. We can, in good conscience, do that. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't come alongside people who may be within our family or people who are friends that are either gay, lesbian, or transgender, or whatever I, sexual identity they want to take on to themselves, that we can't show them love in other ways. But I don't think it is loving to say that, oh, yeah, sure, I want to participate with you and affirm you within this lie that you are seeking to live, um, I, I don't think we can go there. I, I, I think we have to draw a line at that at that right. place, and I don't think that is the right way to express the truth of the gospel uh, to those individuals. Um, yeah, and, and like the wedding example is, well, what is a wedding? <laughs> yeah. What's the purpose of a wedding? Well, that's why in good conscience, yeah. you couldn't go support that because the very purpose, you're affirming what they're doing. And yeah, you're yeah. even, if we take a biblical ceremony, we're saying, listen, we're having this ceremony and these two people are have invited you to say, listen, we are making a covenant with one another and with God in this union of marriage. And we've invited, like a baptism, we've invited yeah. you to come to affirm this and to see yeah. this and to hold us accountable yeah. to what you're you're seeing us do up here, right? Yeah. And so, how could, in good conscience, a Christian yeah. do that against a an, or for a non-biblical? Yeah. Right. I can't, I can't celebrate this yeah. with yeah, you. Yeah, you can't, and I can't affirm it. I can't even. Right. I can't keep you accountable in it, which is yeah, it part of the be, reason why I'm here. It yeah. would be like asking, you know, your, you know, would be like being asked to participate in a pagan ceremony, you know, that that is, you know embraces something that is a false ideology that is anti-Christian, anti-biblical, uh, we can't do that. Anti-God. Yeah. You know, I, I think a good example, you know, when you've looked at some of these stories of um, the florists and bakers and whatnot that have refused to either bake cakes or or provide floral arrangements for gay weddings and things like that, it's not as though they were not willing to serve their gay or transgendered customers under normal circumstances, but once they were asked to participate, uh, you know, something that was anti-Christian, they could not allow their conscience to go there. Yeah. And uh, but the way that the media interpreted that is that it's anti-gay. It's yeah. it's you hate gay people, and therefore you don't want to serve them at all. And that's just simply not true. Yeah, it's um, pro-sanctity of marriage. It's yes. pro-sanctity of what the union means to a Christian, right? That's what it is. It's pro that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's not anti the other, you know? And, and so we had in, 
in light of the sermon this Sunday, I had someone come up afterwards and they work at Starkey Elementary. And they said, hey, I have a question which ties into our topic. And they said, uh, you know, there was a a girl whose parents said uh, third, fourth grade, something like that, played with boys' toys and was tomboy and all that, and that they, through everything that's happening in our society, said, well, we want to affirm her being a boy. So they went to Starkey Elementary and uh, told the school, you know, we want you to now start calling her by her boy name and use the preferred pronoun of he with her. And we want her to start being able to use the boys' restroom. And so Starkey thankfully said, no, we're not going to do that. So did not let her use the boys' restroom. I believe let her use the nurse's restroom. And uh, the parents apparently are, are pushing towards wanting to do some, some uh, uh, puberty blockers and all that kind of stuff, moving into that direction, yeah. even possible surgery or what have you. Well, this person who asked me said, I'm going to have this, this child in my class next year. And do I refer to her with her boy name, the name, and the preferred pronoun? So I just, it was off the cuff, just in my mind, I was just like trying to process it. I said, well, uh, and Bernie really summed this up well, Bernie Page. He said, uh, you can give anybody any name, but God gives us our gender name. Yeah. Mm. And so no, do not call them by their preferred pronoun. You call them by their given pronoun and a name's a name. Mm-hmm. Right, we have in our society we have names that are kind of right. boy names that girls use and whatever. So you can call them blue if you want to. Yeah, call them red, call them orange. But as far as the preferred pronoun, call them uh, what they are. You know, so yeah. that scratches the surface as to the depth of what we're talking about here. But I think that that, that is maybe something. And then I had a conversation with someone in AGB <laughs> maybe the next day. Same thing. Hey, you know. We're being asked as a company, da 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 da. What do you think? And I, I said that. I said, well, a name's a name. Anybody can give a name, but God is the one who gives the gender, yeah, and so right. call them by the gender. It, it would be kind of like, let's say, a, a school <clears throat> board um, came and said, said, we want you to teach the new math, and so that what that means is that we want you to be teaching your kids, you know, that two plus two equals five. You know, and so you need to affirm that and 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 communicate that to your your students. You know, and that's how you need to teach your, your children. Mm-hmm. Well, that's ridiculous. You know, you'd have to say, "No, I can't do that. That's a lie." You know, and so the same thing applies to this whole gender. If if somebody is a a male, you know, it's ridiculous to try to you know affirm a lie that they're a female. And it goes against God's design. It's 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 against truth itself, you know. So why would we want to participate in what we knowingly, you know, understand to be something that is not, is a falsehood? Mm-hmm. And we're asked to embrace a falsehood and yeah. promote it. Um, you know that that has to go against the conscience of any believer. Yeah. Um, it has and to then, go against the conscience of any rational person. Yeah, yeah. But this is where it gets sticky is then when yeah. you're the company that you're working for, I, I don't know. I'm guessing it's gotten to a point where people are getting fired for saying, I refuse to do that. A willingness to say, you know, with the apostle saying, well, we will obey God rather than man. Yeah. yeah. You know, and that's hard. I mean, we're not sitting here saying in a high and lofty position in our ivory tower to say that that is a easy decision because it is you're providing for your family, all those things that go with that. But at the end of the day, our, do we trust God as our provider? Do we at the end of the day? And do we believe that God, if, if, if this door is closed because we were standing for God, that he would not open another door somewhere. I, I believe right. so. Yeah. Right. It, it was, it's a similar type of question if you were asked to, to cheat, you know, on, you know, in a business. If your boss asked you to, uh, to cut corners, you yeah. know, to cut corners or to, to lie about some, you know, some aspect of your business, you know, as a Christian, you would have to say no, and you take the risk of being fired. Yes. So I had a situation when I was in seminary, I worked for an architect, 
uh, in North Hollywood. And, um, you know, the, the principle, I'm trying to get, you know, carry forth this, this principle. You know, I was working for an architect and we had a, we did a project for, for someone in, in, um, Beverly Hills, we did these nice homes, and this person wanted a Japanese style uh, house and and pavilion and and all this stuff, and so I was tasked to design this. So I was looking up Japanese architecture and you know and doing all this kind of stuff, and and uh, and then I was asked to design this little tiny, you know, almost looked like a shed. It was about the size of an outhouse. And uh, and so I asked my boss, well, what is this? What is it that you, I'm supposed to be designing here? And it was a Buddhist shrine. Mm-hmm. And they were going to put like a little statue of Buddha inside this thing and, and some other weird Buddhist Hindu type stuff. Not Hindu, but yeah, they're related religions. But anyway, <laughs> um, and so – I went home that day. I did. I had, hadn't started on it, but immediately I was disturbed. And I went home that night. And I thought, "Can I really participate in doing this? Can I design something that is going to be used for a false religion? That I, I, you know, I could not in my in good conscience do that." Mm. So you know, I wrestled with it. And my you know, my wife and I discussed it, and and we said, "No, I can't. I can't do it." So I went back the next day, and and. Fully expecting that he would fire me and say, you either do this or you don't work for me. And and I took that risk and I and I said, I can't do this. And I, you know, I told him kindly, I said, this is my reason why, you know, as a Christian, you know, I'm being asked to design something that in my conscience I can't agree with. I don't believe in this. Mm-hmm. And he huffed and puffed and got really <laughs> mad at me and said, uh, you, know, uh, you know, all right, all right, whatever. I'll take you off this project and, and, you know, you can work on something else. And so he was mad and upset, but he didn't fire me. And um, But, yeah, you, you have to take those risks. And, and I think in our culture, when you see that, that this, is, this is not just some benign – ideology or just some sort of cultural trend that that is taking place. I mean, there is a decided, yes. concerted effort to undermine uh, a, a Christian worldview and to impose really what is a satanic worldview mm-hmm. um, uh, uh, upon our culture. And we are being asked to to embrace, not just embrace it, but to purposely promote it. Yeah. And, and so the whole effort to ask for pronouns and things like that is a decided part of this ideology of just completely, you know, undermining, um, you know, a rational biblical worldview. Yeah. 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 So with that, I didn't bring this up on Sunday. But that whole that whole agenda and that whole pushing of that we're past the uh, uh, relativism, postmodern. That we're past that, you know. Now, mm-hmm. as I was reading that article, I was like, "That's where I've been stuck. I've been, I'm there. I'm, I just keep thinking, well, what's true for you is true for you. What's true for me is true mm-hmm. for me. And you believe truth is relative. I believe it's absolute. And and you're saying to me, hey, just don't. You can do what you want, and I can do what I want. Let's leave it at that. And that's no longer the point of it, which I didn't. Sp- specify in that sermon, the point of it from their agenda is no longer saying live and let live. Hey, you do what you want Mm -hmm. and I'll do what I want. We're okay. You believe what you believe and I believe what I believe and we'll be okay. Is no longer saying that. What they're saying, this is their agenda. This is what you're saying, Scott. And this is the point of that agenda that it goes way deeper than just a, well, you just don't support us. This is what they're saying. They're saying... I believe what I believe, and if you not only you, – you, you can't believe what you believe, mm-hmm. okay? I believe what I believe as a LGBTQ supporter mm-hmm. and agenda pusher. I believe what I believe. You no longer can't just believe what you believe. 
No longer can you just be neutral about it, but if you don't actually support what I believe and advocate for what I believe, you are evil and you must be destroyed. Hateful hateful and violent. Yes. Yeah, you will pay you will pay a price if you do not agree. Not agree. Yeah, not just be neutral. But you actually have to support and believe and agree what I do and promote what I do. If not, you are evil and you must be destroyed. That's their agenda. Yeah. That's the agenda. And, and what other reason would they have for saying you must agree or you or we want to know what your preferred pronoun is or you need to use these preferred pronouns? Uh, you know, if it wasn't about pushing this agenda and asking everyone promote this or you know or you're gone or else yeah. And uh, and so in the subtle way in which they're doing that as it begins to creep through every aspect of our culture is taking us unawares, and we need to not, you know, we cannot have our heads in the sand right. in this regard. And, and so, yes, what is that going to mean going down the road? I, I think it's there's going to be some lo- a lot of hard decisions yeah. that Christians are going to have to, to, to take, and there's going to be consequences, and... Um, you know, and there's there's going to be lost opportunities. There's going to be fewer places that we can, in good conscience, you know, work. You know, in terms of work opportunities and whatnot, it's coming, and we need to realize that. Yeah, yeah. As far as employment goes, I would say, you know, if you're asked for your preferred pronouns on a on an intake form, you know, you're part of your <clears throat> employee file. I would I would leave it blank. Uh, if that's an option, leave it blank. Um, and then, if they're question, if you're questioned about it, I would just be honest that I, I can't participate in uh, perpetuating someone's uh, delusion about um, about their their gender identity. Um, I, I don't believe it's loving to do that. Um, and uh, we've been looking at this article lately. I mean, I think, Scott, was it yesterday that you sent this out from Rosaria Butterfield, mm-hmm. who was a tenured professor at Syracuse and a really a militant feminist and uh, lesbian, and she was converted and um, is now the wife of a, a Presbyterian minister and homeschool mom. And, um, and so uh, she... I just loved some of the things that she had to say in this. And she's this article is called Why I No Longer Use Transgender Pronouns and Why You Shouldn't Either. Um, she's basically, this is a public repentance for mm-hmm. for what she calls um, pronoun hospitality, right? She was promoting pronoun hospitality and um, in, in order to... Uh, kind be of bridge winsome. the gap, be winsome. And, and it's like this winsome. Is post, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but this is... She was using it post her conversion to Christ oh, yeah. yes. to kind of be, hey, I want to be winsome, soft, right. and yeah, yeah. Yeah, she came out of that community, yes. and she wanted to minister to that community, and so she felt the best way to do that was to use the preferred pronouns like yeah. the many Christians are doing, mm-hmm. and, and it's it's in an effort to try to be quote-unquote winsome, right. and now she's retracting and basically repenting of, of that of that approach. And so, yeah. It's sort of winsome for its own sake, though. Uh, it can be uh, yeah. winsome for winsomeness sake. Um, but uh, she said, promoting pronoun hospitality lends false credibility to a wolfish theology that fails to protect the sheep and instead eats them alive. Mm-hmm. You know, and, I, and, you know, I think you mentioned this Sunday, Murray, about Jesus. He sat with sinners. He ate with sinners, right? Maybe you didn't say this. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe I just imagined it. But he was a friend of sinners, but he didn't sin with sinners. Or approve. Yeah. Or he, yeah, he didn't approve. He, he didn't sin with them. He didn't approve them. Um, and then uh, she says that it's better to make, uh, it's better to love your enemies than to make false friends. Mm. You know, I think when we're using, when we're using someone's transgen- transgender pronouns, what we're doing is um, we're pretending to be a friend, um, but it's a, it's a false friend. And uh, just knowing that trans, she says trans identity and Jesus are not coterminous, which really is a big word for related. You know, you can't, yeah. you, you have to, it's one or the other. It's not, it's not Jesus and my trans identity. It's yeah, it, either or. 
and just to interject there, th- this goes back to this this notion of, well, I'm a gay Christian, or I'm even a same sex attracted Christian. You know, you know, why do you use those sort of uh, identifiers? You know, would we say, well, I'm a I'm an alcoholic Christian, or I'm a right. uh, you know I'm a you know, club, you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> type of, you know, I don't know what thieving, you're I'm a thieving Christian. Yeah. I'm a yeah. thieving yeah. Christian. Yeah. You know, and and why would you take something that that the Bible condemns and attach it to your identity? To your identity in you know, in addition to your identity with Christ, it right. makes no sense. Yeah, but um, as far as the question about family, here's some things to consider: is that using the transgender pronoun is a sin against the creation ordinance, Mm. uh, male and female. He created them male and female. Uh, it's a sin against image bearing. Uh, it discourages a believer's, uh, sanctification, progressive sanctification and falsifies the gospel. It cheapens redemption and tramples on the blood of Christ. It actually, it looks loving, but it's not. It's failing to love neighbor as yourself because it's actually breaking the, what is it, the ninth commandment, bearing false witness. Mm-hmm. You know, you're, I'm actually, if I use your transgender pronouns, I'm actually lying to you yeah. in, in, in going along with your make-believe. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and then it fails to offer genuine Christian hospitality and instead yields the definition of, of hospitality to liberal communitarianism, identity politics. So uh, those are some things to mm. to just think about if you're if you're <laughs> tempted to go along with someone's transgender pronouns is that you're not actually doing them any favor and really fail uh, refusing to use someone's uh, transgender pronouns could be the thing that God uses to wake them up. Mm-hmm. To the gospel, yeah, but but using those, it it muddies the gospel. Yeah. I think Rosaria actually gives a, a, an example of a of a uh, of a transgendered woman who pretended to be a man and right. then came to Christ, and uh, and part of what brought her to Christ was recognizing she grew up in a Christian family where they refused yeah. to affirm her with yes. with her transgendered pronouns and whatnot. Yeah. And, her church uh, refused as well. Yeah, not her just church her family, but her church well. refused it. And and that was used later on to draw her back to to that to to that church and her parents. Um and she appreciated the fact that they stood firm right. in the truth in that Yeah, regard. and imagine what she doesn't explain, imagine how hard that was. Imagine how much turmoil there was within the family. Yes. Imagine how 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 many sleepless nights there were from the parents and how difficult it was. But they said, hey, we have to you probably mom and dad holding hands in bed, praying and crying together, saying we have to stand firm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We we have to stand firm. Yeah. And very difficult and possibly at the loss of a relationship, but yet the truth always rises to the top, does it not? The yeah. truth prevails. Yeah. It, it goes through the crucible, and the dross is is melted off, and the purity of the truth always remains. And that's why, you know, something interesting that I have no research on, I couldn't even begin to explain, but we were at our home group on Sunday, and uh, a couple brought up that back in... World War II in Berlin was a huge transgender community and push, and it tied into everything, the ideologies of World War II that mm. I can't begin to go into. I have no no background in it to know to be able to, to root into that. But just the fact that that and if we go back, okay, let's just go back into what we're reading in our New Testament and we're reading in the Bible and we're reading in in uh, the the great flood and we're right what's happening, the debauchery, the sin, it's sin, right? It's sin and it it has these ebbs and flows. We are currently because we live in this culture and this this current time and these hot bit button issues right now. But at the end of the day, it is sin and it's it, in a way, it's not new. <laughs> Yeah, you know, yeah. which is sad, but also what you know—the acceleration of technology and social media and everything that we have, the artificial intelligence and all the stuff that ties into it—we're just in the midst of it, right. and and it's almost like we see is 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 Christ coming back sooner, right? And but at the end of the day, the truth 
always remains yeah. the truth. Yeah. It has right. it remained the truth back in Noah's day, and it remained the truth in Paul's day and Jesus' day, and it remains the truth now. Yeah. yeah. Right. Something that's that's important to to help qualify all of this too is that we have to recognize that sin always brings with it some, something attractive. In other words, it, 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 sin tells us a lie that if you pursue this, if you engage in this activity, that it's going to bring fulfillment to you. Mm-hmm. It's going to bring happiness to you. It's going to bring a sense of satisfaction and purpose and 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 all of that. And and what the Bible comes along and tells us is is it says that that no that is a lie of the enemy it is it is Satan's deception it's the same deception that he brought to Adam and Eve yeah. uh, and, and it causes us to question the truth that God has spoken and God has said this is true and Satan comes along and says no what God has said is true is not true he's trying to deceive you this is what is true this is what is good for you this is what will bring you true fulfillment and satisfaction and it's a lie yeah. mm-hmm. and, and so if we do anything to participate in that mm-hmm. because people are per- trying to pursue their their sense of of identity and and meaning and purpose and happiness and and fulfillment in these lies and we come along and and do anything to affirm that then then we're participating in in their demise yeah, yeah. in the lie and we yeah. don't care at all about their well-being yeah. yeah satan disguises himself as an uh, an angel of light you know and so the the sin that he proposes looks like life mm. it looks it looks pleasing you know the the fruit looked pleasing to Eve. Yeah. You know, sin looks pleasing or nobody would do it. Yeah, and it's pleasurable for a season, right? right. The Bible says, of but, course, no one would do it if it yeah. was. It looks like life. It looks like it's going to give yeah. life, but it actually brings death the, and heartache. The passing pleasures of sin. Yeah. Mm. Well, okay, I th- that seems like a good place to stop because we have to stop somewhere. Um, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Yes. Um, Murray, would you close yep. us yep. in prayer? Lord, thank you for getting to have a podcast and uh, Lord we want to be true to you as as the three men sitting here and when Chris is here to be true to you to be true to your word to do the best job that we can in that whether uh, we're talking about any subject that uh, that's really our heart's desire and we pray that most of all when we have these podcasts Lord you would be glorified and your church would be edified so we pray that that even be the case today in Jesus name Amen Thanks for listening to the Kerrville Bible Church Podcast. In future episodes, we would like to answer your biblical, theological, or pastoral questions. Send them to us via email at questions at kerrvillebiblechurch.org or leave us a text or voicemail at 830-321-0349.